I am Beto, and you're watching Modern Immigrant. Welcome, everybody, to a new episode of Modern Immigrant. As every Monday, I'm really excited that you're here and that you're ready to learn from an amazing immigrant story. Remember that we have an Instagram account at Modern Immigrant that you can check out if you want more information about the guests and about what we're doing. We also have a website, modernimmigrant.net, where you can discover our book club, our project, Immigration is Good, our shop, our merch, and all of the stuff that we are doing for the immigrant community. Thank you so much for those that have been making donations to this podcast on the website buymeacoffee.com slash modern immigrant because those donations are helping us actually make this podcast and have it ready every Monday. All the money that goes there is for the production of modern immigrants. So thank you so much. Today I have Salua with us. She's an amazing, amazing person. And I was so excited to get to meet her. She's an entrepreneur. She's helping immigrant women run their small businesses. She's a digital nomad, and she's also an author of an amazing book that was dedicated for immigrant women entrepreneurs in the USA, which you're going to see a little picture here if you're watching us on YouTube, so you can see the book. And also in the description, you're going to get the access to her book and her YouTube channel to learn more about the work that she's doing helping entrepreneurs. In this episode, we talk about her two main immigrations that have shaped her. First, she was born in Morocco, and then she emigrated to Belgium when she was a kid with her mom. Later in life, she emigrated to the U.S., to New York City, and we talk about the challenges of living in New York City and the strength and the resiliency that she developed for living there and getting by even though she faced a lot of different challenges that she's going to share in this interview. I hope you find as much inspiration and motivation as I did meeting Salua and meeting her journey because it really inspired me. Remember that um, we are on YouTube and also on all podcast platforms, so don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening. And if you leave us a review, that's always so helpful and it makes us really happy to read about what you are enjoying from each episode. So now I'm not going to say anything else. It's time for you to meet Salua. Thank you so much for being here. One last thing. I totally forgot to mention that we're celebrating episode 100 of Modern Immigrant. Yes, 100 episodes. Thank you for all your support and check out our Instagram so you can join us on a Zoom event we're going to be doing. Welcome everybody to another episode of Modern Immigrant. I'm really excited to be here with Salua in this episode. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, this is really exciting. It's always great to connect with new people and talk to other immigrants and especially immigrants that are also doing amazing work for other immigrants in the community. So I can't wait for people to hear your story. Um, We usually start every interview by asking the guests how and when and where did that immigration journey start? And I can't wait to hear your story because I'm sure there have been a lot of different places so far. Yeah, so um, the first immigrant story I didn't pick, I didn't choose because I was a child. Yes. The second one, I did uh, repeat the same cycle of mm. where, you know, I first immigrated from. So. To make a long story short, my mom and I, we immigrated from Morocco to Belgium when I was a toddler. And that's because she had just divorced my dad in Morocco, where she was married to. And I was born there, too. So I'm technically also a um, I'm also an immigrant to Belgium. Mm -hmm. Then I grew up there, but we had a very um, traumatic childhood, which I didn't know anything about. Well, I thought it was normal until... (laughs) Mm-hmm. my 30s that's where I was like wait a minute because at first I was just like well this is just life you know mm-hmm. but then when I hit my 30s I started to do a lot more work on myself mm-hmm. because I realized I was repeating same cycles and I was also making decisions and mm-hmm. I didn't, I was I think I was sub- it was subconscious on many levels that I had to heal a lot of traumatic things that had happened in my childhood so Early th- in my early 30s, I then did a lot more work on myself. So I tried to, I just was so soul searching, you know, I was trying yeah. to figure out, you know, why am I doing this and why am I attracting these situations mm-hmm. and why I'm working so hard all the time for little returns. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, when I did that, then I found out there was three things uh, that was that kept coming coming back. And I think a lot of immigrants would probably relate. Mm -hmm. The number one was, what, do you want me to share that with you? Is this yes, a, please. Yes, I was going to ask. <laughs> it's, not, it's not related quickly to your questions, but I think it's very interesting. So the first one is the survival mode, the survival mindset, right? Mm -hmm. So we know this so well. We know this too well. And the problem with that is that uh, as you grow up and you become an adult, you think that you have to work extremely hard to get a little in return because you're always surviving. Mm -hmm. so you will make those choices based on that. Yes. So if it's not enough hard work, then mm. it must be not worth it. Or I'm not worthy to get things that easy or, sim or simply. Yep. You know? So survival mindset, and I think uh, immigrants, uh, especially when they start over in a new place, uh, mm. they have to survive. You know, they don't think about the American dream or they think about how am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to pay for rent? How am yeah. I going to get my documentation here? And it's interesting that sometimes we don't even question that. Like we don't even, you know, this is what it's supposed to be like, right? Like as an immigrant, I my first years were in survival mode as well. And well, and sometimes I think we still carry that with us, even yeah. when we're not in survival mode. Um, and I just thought that was the way. Like, you know, I decided to leave my home country, so I have now to suffer the consequences kind of thing. Right. That Which is so tough. Easy. That can be too easy. And to be honest with you, many times I, I got help and I could have, you know, been in a relationship with boyfriends who could have helped me. And But I was so determined to do this on my own. I really chose the tougher road. And honestly, I don't know why. I just thought this yeah. was more worth it. And mm -hmm. somehow it is a little bit, but... If we had a better self-esteem, I think we'd, we could have realized that we deserve to have everything mm -hmm. without putting our body and mind through so much pain. And that asking for help is part of the process and it's completely okay. Yes. So the first one that I think every immigrant listening can relate to, what were the other findings? What? Yes, definitely one. The other one it has to do with money, the financial part that is related to, again, self-worth. So I think, again, with, I guess, my mentality, and I'm thinking a lot of, of immigrant, is we think we don't deserve to be wealthy mm -hmm. and we are always breaking those. We self-sabotage ways that we can really be financially secured mm -hmm. because our mentality is connected with memory of lack. Uh, so... Uh, Yes. And that is really a bad, a bad thing to carry with you, you know, yeah. especially if that's giving you your level of worthiness, right? Like, oh, I'm worthy because I am struggling because I am doing my best to get a little and I need to be grateful and I need to be, you know, and appreciate every little thing I have. But not having the mentality of, okay, this is good for now, but I want more, can really be damaging for yeah. our lives. And so so I found how I named this term. It's called scarcity mindset. Scarcity mindset. It's, mm. it's related to a lot of these. So, for example, me for a long time, I was like, why am I not making money? And like, mm -hmm. I was making money. Money would, would leave right away. And I think it has to do with some subconscious things in my mind where I would not attract money or if I did money coming my way, then it would leave right mm -hmm. away. Some stuff would happen where I could never, where I could never make it grow. Like mm -hmm. I was so focused on that. And so what I did is I worked with a money coach at some point because I was way off in my business and I realized I am, I, I should be way up here with all the work I've been doing. Like I have all the credentials, degrees, I speak different languages, I do all of these things. Why can I just keep growing financially? And so when I worked with my money coach, that was very interesting. We had to actually go back to my childhood. I was like, she said, yeah, I need to figure out what was your first memory of money. 
<laughs> and we did this exercise when I closed my eyes and I was trying to think about what my memory is money. And then I found out it was one time my mom. Uh, so we ended up living in a women's shelter in Belgium because my stepdad was very abusive. He was alcoholic. He was violent. So we ended up living there. And I remember that at some point my mom was counting money and I must have been maybe six or seven years old, something around that. And my mom was counting money, but she was so depressed and so the, 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 her energy was really down and she counting the money. And of course she didn't know what she was doing, but she was really inflicting in me and my sister negative thoughts about money. And she had worked so hard because she was working, cleaning people's home and she would work on a field to pick up the vegetables and she would do all sorts of jobs because she had just immigrated to Belgium. My mom had five children. She had no money, no education. So I saw this woman become a warrior. And that day when she was counting the money, that was the rent money. And she really made me, she told me, you see how hard I have to work to put a head, to put a, a roof over our head. And, uh, and then she kept counting the cash. And I remember this and I told that my money coach, she's like, Oh my God, your first memory of money is totally negative. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to hold the energy, the, the money into your, your energy because mm -hmm. you automatically reject it. Right. That's so amazing. I was recently talking to a money coach for an episode that will be out next week. And I learned so much about that. And it's so interesting that you're talking about it too, because I think it's such an important topic for immigrants that sometimes we don't even think about. We want to make it out here or out there, wherever people are at. We want money, we want to be successful, but all the memories we have about money or all the ideas we have around money are negative, right? right? We even criticize when someone's spending too much or having too much, right? We tend to be like, oh, that's just too much. But we also want the same. We just don't yeah. know. But that's conflicting your own message with money. So I don't know if you are a little spiritual, if you believe in all of these things, but I think it's true. I think that if in your mindset you are giving conflicting messages, then I it's which yeah. doesn't know how to happen to you. Like you want it or you don't, you know? Exactly. And the universe, which I do believe we create those opportunities for ourselves, really doesn't know what to give us. <laughs> like you first need to figure it out. What do you want? And you need and to then, have a healthy relationship with money. You have to enjoy money. You have to look at money like a game. You have, and, and that all of this I skipped because I wasn't taught anything about investing, saving, none of this. All I knew was survive, work, make money, pay the bills, put food on your plate and that's mm -hmm. it. I never saw past that. And I kept repeating this all right. through my life in New York. So in New York, when you did that, that was already your first time immigrating, like after like being older. Cause you said that you did immigrate it with your mom as a kid. So okay. I grew up in Belgium till the age of 20 and oh. 20 years old, I left on my own to New York city and I was really not prepared. I mean, <laughs> and I was going to ask that first, I think it's silly to ask why New York City, being New York City, the city that it is, but what motivated you to go there from Belgium? And yeah, just share with us a little bit about that process of arriving there. I think it connects to my third uh, tip that I wanted to tell you about my self-discovery is self-worth. So mm. that's another thing because we are taught, and again, I'm not talking for everyone uh, because I know there are, you know, it's not happening to all immigrants, but I know for myself that I had no idea what even self-worth was. So I think when I left <clears throat> to go to New York, I chose New York City because I thought in my head, OK, I'm this little immigrant Muslim girl from Belgium. And I know that in order to prove to myself and to my family and everybody else that I can make it, I'm going to pick the most difficult route. And New York was it. I could have gone to Paris. I could have gone to London. I was already in Europe and this would have been a lot easier, but I didn't want easy. I really did. I knew that I didn't want easy. That's crazy. So I picked that because I knew that if I could make it in New York, I could make it anywhere. Like the song says, and I actually think it's true. I think mm -hmm. this city is giving you a real lesson on life because mm -hmm. it really is difficult. A lot of people think New York is all rainbow. 
I'm telling you, the real New York? Mm -mm. No, yes. It's tough. I was recently watching some TikToks. I think I've the my for you page shows me a lot of, you know, people that live in New York and show like this perfect life and amazing and 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 then I sh I, I was looking to another TikToker and he's from Spain and somebody was commenting, why do you live there if you hate it so much? And he said. I don't hate it. I just want to show people the reality of living in the city. I love living in the city. It's an amazing city, but I love his honesty of saying, I'm just tired of people romanticizing a place. And, and he was just being more honest and raw. And I think I, it, it's kind of what you're saying too. This is a difficult place too. Yeah, I would actually like to see that, what he's doing. I would like to... Yeah, yeah I can um, send it to you. And I can also, if I find this exact link, I can also add it in the episode. Sure, that would be super mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, New York, so I forgot what was the question. So why did yeah. I to New York? So, so you, you arrived there and then... Yeah, how difficult, what were the challenges? I mean, I'm sure it was, it was a, a shock. <laughs> Right. But one thing, and I think this is the thing that actually saved me in New York, is that everything that were my challenges as a, a little girl going all the way up to being a young adult is I had sets of challenge. So like I mentioned, my mom was illiterate, so I really didn't, I had to be the, the big the big girl. So I had to translate everything from my mom. I had mm -hmm. to be there everywhere she went. I had to write the mail. I had to speak to the people. So wow. I, I picking up my sister. I had a younger sister, three years younger than me. I remember episodes when I was on the bus at maybe eight years old when my sister was like six, five or six. And we would go to school like that. I mean, and imagine it was in the 90s. That's a different scenario. But imagine this, like we could have been adopted. We could have been like so many things would have happened. Their responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we, so a very young age, I was very mature already. And I also knew I wanted to leave. I didn't want to stay at home because I felt, and that I just don't know how to explain it, but I think that saved me too, because my, my family, as much as they love me, they're somewhat toxic because mm -hmm. they, they, you know, it's uh, it's bad for a young girl to be leaving on her own at 17. Cause at the age I really left the house and I was unmarried and my mom was like losing it. Cause she, she thought. Oh my God, I'm losing her. And so, um, so yeah, so I think coming to New York uh, with all the sets of challenges that I had before actually helped me because then I could tackle on any challenge, really. Yeah, and I truly appreciate that you're bringing this up to this conversation because I think it's something we don't talk about that much and that feeling that, you know, your home, the place where you're at, it's not the place where you want to be, right? There's sometimes some sort of shame, and I know it can be difficult to verbalize it, but I also know that a lot of immigrants have felt that way. And part of that reason is what took us to where we are today, right? So just kind of opening up about that experience really, you know, resonates with me and really makes me feel like sometimes that little desire and knowing that there's something better out there can really save us. Right. Definitely. And another thing that's very interesting that I actually noticed years later is that I actually repeated the same cycle as my mom. Exactly the same. You know, I went to a country I didn't know. I didn't even speak English. I didn't have documentation. I had no money. The only difference is I didn't have kids. But I was on the same level of my mom. And it only hit me years later because I was like, wow, uh, I'm actually just repeating. And it's subconsciously, you know, I'm repeating a foreign, going to a foreign country to, for what? I, I just, I couldn't really understand why. Um, but I'm, I'm very glad I did it. I mean, uh, it changed my life forever. So. Amazing. Wow. That's just so beautiful. I'm excited. I'm excited to hear that. For how long have you been now in, in New York? Now it's going to be 15 years. Yeah. Okay. In 2005, 16, I'm going on 16. Yeah. Wow. How did you, I know this is something that a lot of people sometimes feel curious about, but how was your process of learning English and actually making it there? Like, what do you think took from you to do that and, and find that success? Huh. Well, first of all, like I said, it was really, it was not easy at all. 
So I went through basically all the challenges immigrants go through. I've been, first of all, I couldn't find jobs without papers. But then when I got jobs, I was quickly fired because I didn't get, uh, I couldn't get the rights, you know, to get proper um, notice and get the government help. None of this, like would fire you on the spot. I also was underpaid all the time. And they knew that because they hire a bunch of immigrants here. And when they know you don't have your proper documentation, they'll pay you a fraction of what they pay you if, you know. So, So. yeah, I was I was really treated badly. I I worked at a job one time. I had to be there at five in the morning. I was opening up like a bodega slash in Manhattan. It's very popular because in the in the morning, they people line up to get the coffee before they go to work. So I worked in the in the center upper west. And there I had uh, my job. My boss was paying me five dollars an hour. Exactly that amount. Five bucks an hour. I will never forget that. And I, I couldn't I had to take it because I couldn't find jobs anywhere. So okay. I used to go there. So I wake up at five. No, I had to be there at 5 a.m. Open at six. Uh, my shift was six to three. And then after three, I would go to school. So I would go uh, study. Uh, so I, I ended up graduated with a business degree. Uh, but I've done, and then when they, and I remember when they fired me, because they, they can do that, uh, he said, we don't owe you any money <sighs> on my so life. Uh, yeah. So they do that a lot. I've got fired from jobs. Of, just because they want to replace you or they don't like you or somebody, uh, you know, just don't, don't want you to be there. That's it. And there's no protection for that's depending on, yeah, the immigration status or, yeah, it, it, and it's a tough situation because you have to do it. You need the money. We were talking about survival, right? Like, I mean, yes. Yeah. So, but it took me to get my proper documentation took me about 10 years, you know? So it's okay. tough. And I told you, I got every job. I had to go to school to keep my visa as a student visa. And in the U.S., uh, immigrants pay more than the, the Americans for school. Then we pay out of state tax, which are really, if you go to a different state, you pay a lot more money as well. And you, since you don't understand the system, they just uh, they just play the system with you. They'll make you go to school longer, so you have to pay more for tuitions. I mean, there's a lot of things I didn't know, and I just would fall on my face, and then I would get back up. Um, but I think, and I'm hoping that I think all immigrants have that uh, skill is resiliency. Like we figure it out, you know. Okay, if that doesn't work, we'll figure it out. I remember when they told me in college that I had to pay three hundred dollars for my books per book for university. I'm like, I, I'm laughing because I'm like, there's no way I can afford a book of three hundred. So I just started finding ways. So what I was doing is I would go to. Uh, other classes who were in my same uh, same year, and I would ask to borrow the book uh, during the when they when they didn't have class. So let's say you have your classes at two, mine is at one. We will exchange books like that. I also went to see the teacher, and I would explain the situation, and I would ask uh, for the semester that was before me to ask all the students if they wanted to sell their book for for a discount. That was way before Amazon. And we talk about 2005, 2006. Amazing. And that would happen. And then I would then sell back these books to the year that semester after me. Mm. We would find ways. You won't put ads in all over the schools. I would make copies of pages I needed for my next class. Uh, yeah. That's the resilience. Mm-hmm. That's the resilience. So you won't have to pay those $300. But, you know. What do you think helped you? During those years, during that journey, those, you know, difficult moments, I know at the beginning you talk about starting to find ways to connect with yourself, to learn about your, yeah, like your background, what happened, the impact of certain things. Were there any techniques, either spiritual, religious, um, a friend, like something that you think really helped you. And and I ask you this because I know that a lot of people that are listening might be feeling that way and might not know where to go and, and what to do. Right. Um, I think the first thing that had helped me, and I, I don't know if this is something that people can develop, but in my case, I was extremely fearless when I was younger. So I was not afraid of, uh, I was not afraid of getting my hand dirty. Like I knew I was going to be somewhere where I was going to potentially struggle for a while. Yeah. And I was ready for that. So 
that actually saved me because I think today, you know, as you get older, you you have more fears than when you're young. When you're young, you're like, oh, let's just do it. You'll figure it out, right? And I was I was 20 years old. I'm 38 today, so it's like it's it's a it's a it's a journey. But what I think is that if I had to do all this work again today, I wouldn't. I would not put my body and mind through this. As much as I'm super happy and very proud of what I've accomplished, and I'm not regretting anything, I yeah. just know that the time of doing this depends really on on each one. Like at 40 years yeah. old, I'm not going to go start over somewhere else. I've learned. I'm I'm good. You know. So yeah. We, we, the, the experiences have taught you that, right? And and seeing yourself back. Right. So that was one very important thing. The second thing is I was, and I still am very self-aware and i think this is important that is something you can develop so you have to constantly question yourself and see how you feel like don't don't do things that will make you sick in the sense that if you terribly if you come to a new country and you terribly homesick and you you depressed and you start using i don't know drugs and alcohol to to medicate you don't need to do all this like if back home is better for you then just do that in my case i was very self aware i knew what i wanted i asked myself questions and i remember i still journal till this day and i would write down the the my main project and i would revisit them often so i would say for example papers and I'm like okay where are where are we with papers I'm like okay now I'm doing the English school because that's how I started I started as an au pair I got the oh, first okay. visa oh you did too cool yeah where from uh from Venezuela to Seattle and then I okay. I did au pair and then I did student visa that was kind of my route too I got an OPT to work I got married so okay, it's kind of almost the same right way that's the same thing I did au pair because au pair was the only way actually I could stay in the U.S. I didn't have any yeah. money so I was like okay so I found this au pair gig in Connecticut and uh I thought Connecticut was New York totally wrong it's like four hours up north is yeah uh, but so my first one was au pair the second one was an uh, English school ESL uh right. so there I stayed a long time because I, I didn't have money for college so I was trying to you know, keep that visa. I went from one school to extend it to another school. It's like, okay, after three years of English, I got to. And so the next step was college. And I can actually tell you a funny story about college. Do you want to... So I'm talking again with my broke mindset. So no money, right? And I never had money. My, my parents don't have money. I have to send them money. I mean, it was like, a, you know, I'm, nobody, nobody could help me. It's you figured out. So I met this other girl who who was also an immigrant from Belgium. And it's funny because we're both sisters. Like we were like in our own struggle trying to figure it out. But we, we connected that way. And she was here longer than I was, probably five years more than me. So she got a scholarship at NYU. And when you get a scholarship, at that point, they had transferred money on her account for the scholarship, right? And I needed to go to college because if I didn't, I couldn't get a student visa and I, there was no other visa. I tried everything. I tried the artist visa, the special skill. I was like, what skill? I mean, I tried everything. Yes. And uh, college was the next one. Then I went to every college in New York and I, I couldn't afford it. I just couldn't, it's so expensive. I'm like, how do people, I couldn't get credits because obviously we didn't have credit history. So I didn't exist on the credit line map in the US. Right. So this very genius idea, <laughs> this is too funny. I was like, okay, I finally found a college that was the cheapest that I could find here in New York. And that would give me, they had an international visa with the center student, you know, for international yeah. students. And I went to ask and they said I had to have $10,000 on my bank account to help me to be, you know, to show that I could provide for myself because legal mm -hmm not work as a student so I did 10,000 where the hell I couldn't even pay my rent I lived in a basement apartment with three roommates I mean it was just like how the hell am I gonna find ten thousand dollars right and then when she told me she had the scholarship and we were like ding 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 okay we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna test this I was like this is not gonna work I was like well we'll know we'll see so oh you see it coming, don't you? Yes. <laughs> so went to school. What she did is she said, okay, I'm going to transfer the money to your account. And then you're going to take that to, you're going to print the statement and you're going to go to college and file the application. 
So I went and I honestly thought they were going to ask me for three months or they're going to ask me for more, but they didn't. So I arrived there. I showed her all the paper and I dressed really nice. I was very proper. I told her I wanted to study business and I showed her everything. And then she looked at everything and then she gave me a stamp and she said, okay. Uh, she said, <clears throat> all you got to do now is to go back to your home country, Belgium, and then reapply for a new visa. But here you have the acceptance of college and you just got to show them these documents. I left. I was like, okay, thank you. I went back to my friend. I was like, I think this it worked. Yes. So, yeah, but I, well, I wasn't out of the hole yet. So I was just like, I just got the, the authorization for it. So I was like, okay, okay. So then I transferred back the money to her account. So that was really nice for her to do this for me. And that's why I think we need angels when we really need them. And that's another thing I'll talk to you in a second. But this is a very important point. So I go back to Belgium. I okay. go to the embassy, the American embassy. I apply to get my student visa. And... Uh, they interview me in English. Why do you want to go to the U.S.? Uh, and I tell them I just want to learn the culture and speak perfect English so I can come back because they want to hear this. So I can come back. And I don't know if there's any immigration people listening, but hey, we're going to tell them what happened. And hey, so, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> this is the reality. I think we all went through that. And then um, so I can come back and really, you know, use my skills and what I've learned and yada, yada, yada. So she said, okay, but I know the interview was intense. And then she said, wait in this waiting room. I said, okay, thank you. I waited and waited and waited. And I was like, oh my God, is this going to work? Because if it doesn't work, what am I going to do? I'm nervous. Yeah, I was nervous. And then they call me up. They're like, uh, miss, okay, can you come here and pick up your passport? So I go and she said, enjoy your, enjoy your trip to the United States. So I was like, thank you. And then I grabbed my passport, but I didn't look. You know, I stepped outside because the uh, embassy in the, in Brussels, it was, is very, very strict. Like there is a security everywhere before you go in. They, they, like it's like at the airport. So it's only when I left the embassy that I opened my passport and I looked at the visa because I thought I was going to get a visa for a year. Guess how long my visa was for? Like six months. Five years. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Yes. That's <laughs> As a student, that's huge. It's five years that you don't have to worry. Yeah. Well, I do have to worry because now I got to pay for college. <laughs> that's Did another I part. That's another. One step at a time. You got the visa. Yeah. I was wow. just like, okay, now we got to pay for this because this is like super expensive. Yeah. So, but I was super excited when I told my friends and I went, I came back and then uh, I walked my way up. I went to college and I did work. But at that point, I was like, for the next five years, it was straight up struggle, man. I worked mm -hmm. the day, I worked at night, I studied. I was, I was tired. You know, I had, I yeah, I worked in nightclubs, bars, anything that could get me money. Uh, and I had great personality, so I was really good in customers. So that, that's the thing that really helped me. I remember uh, at some point they put me behind a bar at a French restaurant, super fancy French restaurant, and I had no idea what the drinks were. So the guy would like. Oh, tell me a drink. He was like, well, can I get a stoli on the rocks with a twist and uh, make it dirty? And I'm like, first of all, my English, I was like, what the hell he just said? And I don't know. So I would run to the other bartender and I was like, please, miss, I don't know. What yeah. do you oh. English. And he goes, oh, so what? you don't know how to make I was like, I don't know. You know, um, but anyway. And so, yeah, but you know something I think really, really important. And I think it's hearing you and I feel inspired by what you're saying you said that you were very clear on what you wanted on your goals on your and you wrote them down and you had a journal and I think that's something that we can all learn from like if at some point you're not there right if at some point this is too much and the end goal is not even clear I like that you talked about go back like or find other opportunities but it's sounded like for you it was really there and you really wanted to make it there and that kept you going in a way yeah uh, yeah it kept me going and I think it saved me because I think if I had say stayed home back home I don't think I would have accomplished anything that I've accomplished here and mm -hmm. I think it was much limited and uh staying sometimes with the toxicity of family is not good because if you have very heavy goals and your family doesn't, which will happen with me, uh, mm -hmm. 
who are an outsider. You're a black sheep, you're different, they don't understand you. Until this day, you know, because today I'm a digital nomad. So my mom, she is so disappointed. Like she wants me to have a home and a husband and kids and have a nine to five. And that's her definition of success for me. And we it's don't different. hide it. Out. Yeah, it's very different. She thinks I'm lost. And, and I think staying with them could pull this back, right? It, it can like make you not move forward as you have. And this is a perfect point to talk about our next topic or question, which is, I wanted to ask you about your accomplishments. So I wanted to talk about your book, which I'm really excited about. And do you have it? Yes, I have it. Absolutely. Immigrant women entrepreneurs, like how amazing. <laughs> Let's see it. And I'm going to make sure I add all the links so people can. I know they can pre-order now, right? When is going to be out? Uh, so they'll be completely out at the end of September. However, I highly recommend to pre-buy it now because after that, it's gonna, the price is going to go up. Right now, we sell it at $27 because it's on pre-sales. After that, it will be up to $35. But what I found out is companies like Amazon and Ingram, because you learn as you develop your marketing strategy for your book, these company can, uh, they want to get their cut and they're very expensive. So some of them want to raise the rate up to 40, which I'm trying to fight. Uh, and then, which means that I won't get any profit, but at least it will be on their platforms. Yes. Oh, um, it, cost, it cost a lot to make because I did, I did this self publish. I work with a print and delivery company. Mm -hmm. And right now I still, if I, if people buy it directly from my website, I can give them the rate of 35 after the launch. If they buy it now before the end of September, They'll get it at 27 and I will sign it. So I will order all of this in bulk to me, sign them, and then ship it ship it directly to them. I'm going to make sure I pre-order it now. When this episode is out, I think it's going to be mid-October. So we're going to just add the link, I guess, that you give me so people yeah. to purchase. So okay. I'll send you the pre-order the pre link. Okay, you ready? Yes, I'm so ready. Ah, how pretty. Oh, my God. Really so... And the stack uh, of cover is really pretty and so uh, beautiful women in the book. So we have 28 women in there. In the back, we have a little bit of story. There's my foot. My you are so beautiful. Just seeing that, it just makes me feel so proud of you'll all of those women. What you said? Maybe you'll be on the next one. Oh, my goodness. Nice. That would be an honor. <laughs> so you a um, little bit. It's like, for example, here's a foster family I stayed in when I was a kid. So I'm right here, and then I met them again this year. So That's I to connect with them. And uh, this is one of the women, Hanadi. She's from Lebanon, and I share their stories in the book. And we have Reina from Mexico. So beautiful. The sure. paper, the quality looks amazing. It's Everything is really nicely done. The photos, the writing, and then even on the right, for example, in here, we added yeah. the name of their business, how long they've been in the U.S., where are they how from. Long? We really have uh, a lot of information, so I have really great information. So and I, I wanted to speak on two topics in this book uh, outside yeah. of the stories, and one of them was funding immigrant women. So, for example, here, this is going to be, those two wow. pages are going to talk about this, so one of the reasons why women immigrants are struggling is because we don't get funded. We don't get access to loans, to investments, credits, because we don't have credit history. They don't know where we're from. They don't know how we didn't stay. We, we didn't live in the country long enough. So all of these questions and the fact that women get less funded than men, that's another topic. So forget about immigrants or women of colors, you know, I love the idea of adding that into the book and just empowering women that are going to have this book and also men that are going to read it to right. raise the awareness on this topic and on how complicated it can be to also understand what this women did is amazing. Yeah, I think it's very important. I hope this will change. Uh, but honestly, with this book, I'm not looking right now. All I'm looking for is to inspire and to share the stories so we can highlight the stories and yeah. educate because a lot of time, and that's something I've learned in the U.S. When, when ignorant people think about immigrants, they think about people crossing the desert to come to mm -hmm. America to steal Americans' job. That's what I've heard. Huh? This is not. 
and then when I put women like this in my book who come here, uh, not crossing the border, but legally with their studies or they get married or whatever the situation is, they build businesses. So not only they're not taking your job, but they create jobs for you and they pay taxes and they create uh, solutions for problems to yeah. make this country a better place. Like major companies right now are run by immigrants. Google, yes. Jeff Bezos is a, a, an immigrant. Did you know that was half Cuban? You have, uh, what's his name? Um, the iPhone guy, uh, Steve Jobs. He yes. was so adopted by a Syrian family. Uh, and we need so much of that education. Like I, I, I really feel passionate about this topic because with the podcast, I started to discover this thing. I started to discover the idea that we have of an immigrant as the only idea and not all the things that we have that we can do. And I started a project that's called Immigration is Good, where I highlight all the positive things that immigrants are doing, especially in the U.S., and I have been learning so much by doing it and by highlighting and, and by spreading the message of immigration is good. We are doing so much good because immigration is usually really like when you think about the word or when you Google it, all the things you get are scary things, are illegal stuff, are always is like related to legal issues. And I'm like, we're so much more than that. We're doing amazing things. That's spreading fear. That's all it does. It's That's all fear. it does. Terrible stories. And it's like, okay, there's a different reality of immigration as well. So I'm glad that, that I'm able to meet you and get to know the work that you're doing, because I think it's wonderful that we get to educate others. So congratulations on the book. Can't wait to have it <laughs> in my hands. One thing that I wanted to highlight also that I found interesting when I was working on this book is that in the book, I have every type of woman. So we have women of color, but we also yes. have women. We have women right. in Islam and we have, so I wanted to show you this because for example, this is Regina. She yeah. is a, an entrepreneur as well. And she's a white woman from Germany, right? And then we have uh, other women, for example, here we have Excel and she's from Cameroon. So I found out in my research that a lot of people confuse expats and immigrants. And I was like, well, let me hear what you have to think. And a yeah. lot of it had to do with racial. They were like, well, expat, they white people who come to work and they live there. And then immigrants are the uh, people who come from low, third world countries to get. And they're undocumented. And, mm -hmm. Yes. And I was like, well, you got it all, all wrong. That's why this book actually have uh, women from everywhere. And I didn't want to mix that up. I wanted to make sure that people can see someone from Germany and say she's an immigrant. And I love that you use the term immigrant women in the cover. Because we have, like, we have to be proud of it. It's, there's no, like, the people that use the expat term, yeah, it's based on privilege, I think, and it's not yeah. fair. They are immigrants too. <laughs> yeah, unless you know, the, the the difference is very it's very subtle. If expat come here on short term contracts, right. they come here to work either in the military or they are diplomats, and they come here for a certain amount of time, and they maybe four years, five years, and then they either travel to another place or they go back home. That's expats. But mm -hmm. immigrants, they leave everything. They start yeah. over and they yeah. build yeah. new. That's the difference. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter where they come from, you know? Exactly, or how they look like. And look like. It, this is wonderful. And I want to ask you, before we move to the digital nomad, I do want to ask you, why do you think all of these women that you have in your book or that you have met in your journey, these entrepreneur women, have in common? Why do we all immigrant entrepreneur have in common? And I think I'm sure many things, but one thing that kind of. Right. Um, so I do ask a question like this in the book. And the question is, what, what do you think is the secret to immigrant entrepreneurs? That's, that's the idea. And so what we get to is, um, first of all, what they have in common is that they bring something new to the table. You know, they come from a different culture. So when they come here, they are able to bring that with them, which I think is colorful and is amazing to add this to the American, because America is based on immigrants anyways. So uh, I think that's one point. Another point is that because they come from somewhere else, they can see uh, opportunities when most people don't. And that's, I think, is from everywhere. Like, for example, when I went to Morocco uh, this year, it was my first time and I stayed six months and I could see opportunities everywhere. I'm like, why don't people who live here don't see it? So mm -hmm. and I that's something that we've built because we've traveled and we've started over. 
we can see opportunities and that's not only we see them, but we act on them. Exactly. How do you have a small nail salon that opens in the middle of San Francisco when the rent would be $40,000? I'm making this up. And you have a group of people from, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know, Philippine, Korea, Asian group who would open a nail salon. How the hell do they do that when a regular American person sometimes cannot even get out of, uh, of their own little town? Like, explain that to me. How do they manage to create a system to find the money, to develop a team, and to offer services where people pay a lot of money for? How? Most of them don't even speak English sometimes. And they still are so successful. And we go and we, yes, it's amazing. And it's like this for you have you have a Asia, the nail salon on, run by Asian mostly. And then you have here in New York, you have the diners run by Greeks. You have the bodegas run by the Indian. The taxi cabs are also the Indian or the Southeast Asian. Then you mm-hmm. have the Arab who also run bodegas. Uh, you feel like you have all those little yeah. pockets. You have Latinos who run stores as well. And we all need them. The massage yes. place, all of these places makes makes the diversity of this country, all run by immigrants. I love it. I love the acting because that's the difficult part, right? We can all have great ideas, but acting on them and, and following up and being consistent. And, and yes, thank and you. That's an amazing thing. I would add resiliency to that. Maybe yes. Resilience. So we've seen so much challenge already that this is nothing. You know, we don't stop at the first. No, we'll figure it out. We figure it out. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. And I think we can all kind of resonate with that. And to end the interview, we're getting a little to the end, although I feel like I can continue to talk to you. There's so much stuff that I can ask you. I want to touch on the digital nomad topic because that sounds amazing and challenging. And I feel like a lot of people don't know what it is. So what's a digital nomad? How does that look like? So digital nomad is someone who can work Uh, from anywhere. So usually from your laptop, and then that gives you the freedom to travel the world and be anywhere as long as you have good Wi-Fi. Um, And so the funny thing is after 15 years of being in the US and done everything that I needed, I was like, well, now that I get my my papers and everything, it's time to go. (laughs) That's amazing. I had worked hard to build this online business. So my job really is a business coach. So what I do is I help people, mainly immigrant women, start an online business so they can work from anywhere. So I have a whole program and I coach one-on-one. I have a long six months program where I really take them through each step-by-step so they can do and have this life as well. Um, So Digital Nomad looks like I actually stay a month minimum in one place. And uh, sometimes more, depending on if I like it or not. Like in Morocco, I liked it. I stayed six months. In Portugal, wow. I stayed three months. Turkey, I stayed three months. And then I just I just hop uh, based on where I'm at to where I'm going next. So I don't make a huge jump. I will just do maybe a couple of hour of flights or train, and, uh, and I will explore. So I'm very disciplined with my schedule as well. So I'm not just hopping around. I have to make money, obviously. But what I found out, and this is the reason why I really love the digital nomad lifestyle, is that you can make your money in the westernized country like the U.S. Most of my clients are here. And then you can live in a third world country where it's paradise when it costs you a fraction and you can live really, really well. So technically, when people see me traveling like that, they think I have the life. But no, I just budget properly and I know where I'm going next. And it, most of the time, it costs me nothing. So I can reinvest back in my business. This is really oh, excellent. Genius. <laughs> excellent. Uh, however, I think it's not for everyone because mm-hmm. there's a lot of downside to that. I'm like single, no kids. So I can just pick up and go anytime. I also sometimes get really lonely because you have to be on your own most of the time. You go to places, you don't speak the language. You have to figure stuff out as you go. Um, so I think it really is it's very exciting, but I also know it's not for everyone. You also have to be very minimalistic. So you travel with the luggage in a backpack. You know, if you have so much stuff in America, they do. They a lot of them have so much. It was the country of consumerism. So, you know, so there's many things. I actually did a video. I have a YouTube channel, and I share, yeah, I share all that. So there's one video when I share about the pros and the cons of um, of being a digital nomad. So it would be good good info for you for you to watch it maybe if you're interested. Yeah, I really like what I saw on your YouTube channel and so much content and so many resources. I think it's great. And I would like listeners to definitely check it out because 
yeah, I mean, it's good to kind of explore the different options that we have and opportunities. And I think for immigrants, it's also a great opportunity to explore because there maybe we're, we, I think all immigrants kind of like that piece of traveling, learning from new cultures. And, and so it's a great way to do so. So right. where can people either access to your services as a coach or watch your YouTube? Like what are those um, social media handles that we can, that we can use to find you? Sure. It's, uh, uh, so it's my name technically. So my website is saluaibalin.com. It's my name. Uh, Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram. It's also Salwa Ibalin. And my YouTube too. It's uh, Salwa Ibalin TV. So maybe we can put that down so people can, uh, can yeah. see it. Um, but yeah, definitely, because I think uh, it's all related. So on my YouTube channel, I show how, you know, I take people in many places and all the countries I've traveled and I show them how to live as a digital nomad. So I'm not a tourist vlogger. I'm all about, okay, where can you find lodging? Where can you work? Can you find work here? Can you get your paper here? So I'm trying to, you know, really give good information. And then I also use it as a funnel because people contact me then to work with me. And that's really excellent. And I can sell the book as well. It's a good funnel for me to share. The book. Perfect. And um, where are you located now? Where are you going next? Are you right now? It sounds like you're in New York. Are you there for a short period of time? What comes next? So the thing is, after coming back, so I left for two and a half years. Huh? Uh, I, I left the U.S. and I just traveled full time for two and a half years. And honestly, I don't think I want to settle back here. I came back here because I needed to promote the book. So that's why I'm here. Uh, but when I look at New York now, I love it, but I don't think I want to live here anymore. I mean, it's it's so overly, overly priced and and I don't want that life again of going to two, three jobs. To, no, I'm not doing that. And even if I was super wealthy, I don't think I would live here anyways, because the real estate is very you get a lot. You get little too small for your money, in my opinion. You know, yes. but, you know, in Morocco, you get a villa for a thousand US dollars a month. A villa. Here, are you, you're lucky if you get a studio and you share it with somebody in New Jersey, even. Yeah. And when you went, I'm just curious to ask you, when you went to Morocco, was that the first time after you were a kid? Or No. Okay. Went back and forth with my mom every summer. I was a kid. So I went there, so I've seen it. But I last time I went to Morocco was at the age of, uh, it was 30. No, it was seven years ago. However, it was the first time in my life that I went there alone as an adult and I stayed more than two weeks. So I really wow. did experience it. I got an apartment. I had wow. to navigate the country alone. And um, and it was a, a fa amazing experience. One thing that I realized, and maybe you will realize that if you go back to Venezuela, is that I realized that in the end, I'm actually not Moroccan. Like I look like it and my blood is Moroccan, but I'm felt so out of so out of place. I'm like, I'm, you know? Yes. Like, and you know, I have been what? back in like a year. So, and I left older enough, I think, but I think I totally understand what you're saying. Cause I have felt it even when I meet people that just arrived from Venezuela and like, I'm so out of like what the words they're using now or the things that the songs they're listening, like I'm not up to date. <laughs> Completely up. You know, when I was this time, my, my brother said, okay, we're going to go see an aunt in the, in the countryside. So I was like, okay, we'll go. And then, and then I went and I, they all sat down there talking and I was sitting there. I was like, what the hell? I am not interested in what they're saying. I was like, so out of it. So I walked out. I was like, oh, I'm just going to go around. And I took my phone and I started filming videos. I was totally not in tune with, with what they were talking about. Right. It's so difficult. And I feel like, I mean, now that you're a nomad, do you feel like it's harder for you to answer where are you from when people ask you? Yeah, I always say Morocco, you know, because uh, if I say Belgium, they look at me twice, not wondering, like I'm brown with big hair, Belgium. Okay. Yeah, they just don't get it. So I say Morocco. And then if the conversation goes further, I'd say Belgium and American. But I'll, I'll leave it to that because then I have to get into details. And yes. <laughs> we want to make it easy for them or for us but i would recommend you i don't know if you're thinking about becoming a digital nomad but i can tell you that it changed my life for the better in the sense that you become really rich you know with all the cultures and the people you meet around the world and i made a lot of clients as well so my business grew as i was traveling i was able to do an event in portugal i was invited to i did another one in prague i was invited to another one in morocco i was like wow it's actually building my my resume and my, my, yeah, my network. So 
even if you cannot do it full time, if you could take like two months out of the year and just wander and go places, I think it would really open up many, many things for you and whoever decide to do it. It sounds amazing. And and just to end the interview, I want to ask you a last question. And it's especially for those that are thinking about doing it, but it seems like it's difficult to make for what I heard to make that transition, right? To fully go digital. What would be like a good advice for someone that's, you know, have their nine to five job, but they also have their business, when to do it, when to make the leap? Right. Well, there's different type of digital nomad, first of all. You have, first first of all, you have the remote workers. So those, if you have a job and your company allow you to work remotely, that's perfectly fine. You can still travel and at least you can remain, keep your salary. For mm-hmm. me, I'm completely on my own because I work for myself. So I make my own sales calls. I make my own ads. I mean, I have to constantly pitch and, you know, so that's not for everyone. I mean, you ha- you really have to learn how to sell. Uh, look, who contacted you on Instagram? You. Thank you. So I'm out there and I'm go ahead and I, I don't sit and wait. I just really put the work. And if you're not ready to do this, then maybe don't open your own business. Uh, but you can work for a company that would perfectly. There's tons of them huh, who offer they just completely remote and that can work totally fine. Um, the other thing that I would say is to have minimum three months of saving money on an account because that's another mistake a lot of nomads do, especially young ones. They're just like, oh, I'm going to travel the world, blah, blah. And then if they stop not having an income, then you can be stuck somewhere and that can be really bad for you. So really make sure you have enough money saved that if you need to take a ticket trip back home to your parents or wherever, at least safe in case, especially now with the pandemic. Did you see, like, I got stuck many places, but at I least was I was thinking in, about that. Yeah, I got stuck in France, I got stuck in Morocco, and I got stuck in Belgium. But honestly, I find ways. I mean, when I was stuck in France, I was like, okay, I, because after a week of lockdown over there, it was really, really stressful because you, you could only leave the house with one document and you can only go one kilometers outside. You had to sign the documents. You had to prove the reason of why you're leaving your house. Yeah. Wow. And after a week of doing that, it's like, I can't do this anymore. So I literally left. I made myself a document that I was working for myself, which is true. And then I crossed the border to Switzerland and they didn't have lockdown there. So I spent time there. So you wow. have to constantly, you know. And be creative for what you're saying. Like, it sounds like you're a very creative person. So I think just thinking in different ways. And take risks. You know what? Like at that point, I was like, okay, if I get caught, they're going to give me a fine. You know what? I'll pay it because at this point, I don't want to continue living like this. But some people don't have a choice. You know, they're stuck. They're stuck. I, we get it. Like old people who can go anywhere. I get that. But if you're young and bright and just go ahead and, and find ways, there's ways, always a way. There's always a way. This has been so helpful and such a fun and amazing interview. I'm really glad that you found this podcast and you were willing to share your story because I know a lot of people will appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. Thank you so much, Salua. And we'll be looking at your book and keep following your journey as a nomad. Thank you. Thank you.